All right. So we got a lot of stuff going on tonight. Um, because we, um, because I do the first day of the test as a, an office hours day, which seemed to be really good idea this time. I love how many people showed up. Um, because we do that, um, I, all of chapter five ends up being in one class. And it seems like a lot more than it is. It's really not super complicated or, I mean, there's a lot of little things, but it doesn't take a terribly long amount of time. Um, the probability, this is the probability unit and it's going to feel like it doesn't fit with the stuff we've been doing. But a lot of that reason is because we've been really focusing on um, stats, on the statistics portion. Now we're going to be jumping more into probability stuff. Yes, they're there. Yes, they're connected very much. Otherwise, they wouldn't all be in one class. But um, we're really going to start focusing on probability. And you'll see how all of this applies to future stuff as we get into future stuff. But this is like the basics of probability. So um, the many most of us don't remember anything about seventh grade math. If your seventh grade math teacher made it to the statistics portion, this is the stuff that they would have covered. But um, I know that I don't remember seventh grade math. And I don't even know if the standards were the same back then. And I don't expect any of you to remember it or even I don't know if your teachers got to it. So I'm going to treat it as if you've never seen it before. And I don't expect you to have seen it before. So the first thing we're going to do in 5.1 is we're going to talk about um, what probabilities look like using the empirical method and the classical method. And to be honest, I until I taught this class, I never called them empirical method and classical method. I called them experimental and I don't remember the other word. I don't know. It's It's been a day. But anyway, um, experimental is one of them. And then the other one, I don't remember. Okay, it'll, it'll come back to me. Anyway, you're not going to have to remember which is which or what they're called. And then in section 5.2, we're going to talk about or probabilities, which involve the addition rule. And you're going to learn the general addition rule. And then we're going to learn about something called a complement rule. And that doesn't mean that the math tells you you're pretty. It um, is an actual term that means complement because this is complement set of complement. So, okay. 5.3. This is for and probabilities. We are going to take a look at the multiplication rule. We're going to talk about independent events. And then we're going to do something really important. This is the thing that for some reason, pretty much every, every term people struggle with the most is at least probabilities. So we'll look at those. So that is our night. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. Well, at least for me, because this math is always fun for me. So I hope you guys at least enjoy the ride a little bit. Here we go. So um, where haven't we have an experiment where we're rolling a die? So identifying all of the outcomes. So the outcomes are every possible thing that can happen when you roll a die. I will never make you write it like this. I will never make you do all of this because think about if I was saying pull a card out of a 52 card deck, you would have to write event one, pulling out a one of diamonds, event two, pulling out a two of diamonds. And you would have to go through every single um, of the 52 cards. I will never make you do this. I don't think that I'm pretty sure the homework doesn't either. So, but if you were looking for all of the outcomes, this is how you would write it. Now, heads or tails, possibly. So B, this is something more like what I will um, request of you. This is a sample space. A sample space is all of the possible outcomes, but it's written as a set. So these are little curly brackets. And so it is as a set. So if I was, However, if I was writing a sample space about rolling two die, I'm not going to write all of it because there's 36 possibilities. I would write something that's a curly bracket. I would like write a one and a one and two. Uh oh, I should have done heads and tails. One and two, and then one and three, then one and four, one and five. You'd put them together, or um, and then you would have to do all 36 outcomes. I'm not going to make you do that either, but just showing you in each thing, you'd have to put both of the outcomes. So I can roll a one and a, rolling a one and a two 
is different than rolling a two and a one. That makes sense because they're two different dice and they could each do their own thing. Okay. So an event, an event is kind of what we're looking for. So like my event is I, I want to roll an even number. So then we look at what is a success if I have this event. So my event is roll an even number. And then the successes would be two, four, and six. So if I get the outcome of two, four, and six, that's an event, or that's the success of the event. All right, questions? Okay. Hold on, I gotta grab my water. I feel I'm gonna need it in a minute. Okay, so S is for sample space uh -huh. and E is for the event. Correct, yes. Okay. It's not letting me move. Why is it doing this to me? Sheesh, I think I had that problem last time. All right, Empirement, empirical approach. Um, so this is also, I call it experimental. Ah, oh, the other one's theoretical, sorry experimental. <laughs> See, I knew the word would come to me. So I call this experimental probability. That's what I grew up learning it as, experimental probability, but it's also called the empirical approach, not to be confused with the empirical rule. Two completely different things. We just like to reuse um, vocabulary and call it different stuff because um, they apparently like to confuse you and there's not enough other words out there in the world. I don't know. So what we would do is this is if you were running the trial. So if I'm rolling the dice and then I'm counting the number of times that I get an even number, this would be my frequency of E. So how many times did I get a success? That is the numerator of my probability. The denominator is how many times did I roll that dice? So if I keep rolling and rolling and rolling the dice, and let's say that I rolled the die 50 times, and 27 of those times I rolled an even number out of 50, this would be my um, probability um, of rolling an even number based on my evidence, my observations from rolling the dice. So this is when you do the experiment. That's why I call it experimental because it in my brain, it triggers that, that this is the experimental probability. So it's kind of like just the relative frequency. I mean, that's what it is. How many successes did I get out of how many total trials? So this is actually performing the experiment. All right. I'll give you all a second and then we will move on. All right, let's go to the next slide. So let's take a look. So Pass the Pigs is a Milton Bradley game. Um, pigs are used as dice. Have any of you ever played Pass the Pigs? I had somebody like last term or the term before that had, and I had to go out and buy this game because I was like, this looks really cool. So there are six different ways that the pig can land when you throw it. You throw pigs instead of dice. <clears throat> so when you throw the pig, it can land a certain different, a certain way. So a class of 52 students rolled pigs 3,939 times. The number of times each occurred is recorded in the table to the right. So that's our frequency. This is our frequency distribution model. And so we are going to calculate, yep. We're gonna use these results to calculate the relative frequency or the probability based on our trials of each thing happening. I'm gonna tell you, I have never rolled a leaning jowler. Never, I tried, I have never rolled that one. All right, so let's take a look at this table. So we're gonna build a probability model. So I take 1344 out of how many was it? 3,939. I hope that that wasn't, nope, okay. I'm gonna do that math. 1344 divided by 3939. So this is, 0 0.34 approximately. So you can leave the probability either way. Doing it this way allows me to look at, okay, 34% of the time 
it's kind of more meaningful because we could actually use it for answering questions. Side with the dot, 1294 divided by 3939. So it's about 0 0.33 approximately. The rays are back 767. So you've all got this relative frequency stuff down. It is the same thing. It's just called a different word. And there's no, like, I, I usually do at least to, at least to two, sometimes I'm going to put one more there. Let's just do three. It doesn't matter. There's no like tried and true. This is how many you have to do. If I don't tell you, then you just pick a number. If I don't tell you what I want you to round it to, you can just pick a number. 365 divided by 39, 39. 0 0.093. 137 divided by 3939. 0 0.035 32 divided by 39. 39. What was that? I have a question. Okay. On the pre recorded um, videos, you were saying to simplify. Yeah, if you, you leave it as a like fraction, that. simplify, yes. And why is that? Why can't we just go like the 1344 over 3939 equals like you've got it you right can now? Do that, but if you leave it as a fraction, simplify it. Oh, so if you leave it as a fraction? Yes, if you leave it as a fraction, simplify your fraction. Like um, some of these, my open math will tell you to um, um, to leave it as a, put it in there as a fraction. Make sure it's a simplified fraction. And your calculator okay. can do that for you. Do you guys know about simplifying fractions in your calculator? Calculator is no. magic. Let me show you. Yeah, I don't either. Okay, I'm going to show you the magic. Okay. I just break out my old calculator, like one of the <laughs> generic ones. Yes. This calculator is calculator magic. Hold on a second here. Let me get in there. Every every term I learn something new and I'm like more and more impressed with what this thing can do. I was this morning, I learned about the dice simulator on the um on the calculator. There's an actual dice simulator that you can roll dice and simulate it and flipping coins. And there's so much cool stuff. And usually my oh, students my at the high school teach me, but really cool okay maybe log in please why is it being so difficult today sheesh okay all right so let's just i'm going to put a fraction that i know can be simplified um make this a little bit bigger okay so i'm going to put the fraction um uh -oh. get clear i'm going to put 64 divided by 128. I'm just going to put that in there. I know that that can be simplified. And then you hit the math button. It's a button right under alpha, hit math. The first option is fraction. And it's saying to simplify that fraction and it simplifies it for you. I was so confused. I'm like, this calculator is so amazing and it does all of these things, but it won't simplify a fraction. Yeah. I mean, it also will put like, if I had 0 0.125 and I want to make that a fraction, hit math and then I have fraction and then it'll make that a fraction for me also. So I'm sorry, I'm not getting it. I okay. Don't get it. Can, you, yeah, can you show me one more time? Okay. Um, I'm going to put... 300 divided by 12,485. Okay, there we go. And then you hit math, which is right under your alpha button. Hit math. And that's the first option is fraction. It's frac. Okay. And then hit enter. And then you'll just hit enter again. Oh, that okay. is so cool. Yeah. And if you get an answer, wow. like, 
you know, let's say that I did the 300 divided by one, whoops, I did 300 divided by 585 and I get a, I get a decimal. Then if you hit the math button fraction and it, it'll just make it a fraction. So even if it's your last answer, it'll do that also. I mean, there's so much cool stuff this, this calculator can do. My favorite feature, and this has nothing to do with what we're doing right now, but we're right here. My very favorite feature is the copy and paste because I don't oh. ever round my numbers until I get to the very end. I just leave it in my calculator. So if you arrow up and you highlight something and you hit enter, it'll paste it in for you. And you can go as high as you want. You can like go back to like anything that you've had in here for a while and say, oh, I want this right here. And then, you know, it, it'll paste it for you. So copy and paste is really amazing. You just arrow up and so highlight. highlighting. Okay, arrow up, highlight. And arrow up and just highlight something and then hit enter and it'll paste it. Okay. Oh my God. So frequently I will make an error. Like let's say that I was trying to do 15 minus seven and I did actually accidentally did 77 and I hit enter and I'm like, that's not what I wanted. I can go up and highlight 15 minus 77 and then go back here and hit delete and delete that. And now I can do my actual correct math. So you can go up and fix a typo. Oh. So. I also love to, I love to use that when you're doing like a, a square root or something like that. It makes it so much easier. If you can just simplify the answer mm -hmm. under the radicand and then enter it in, I find oh. that makes it way quicker. The fact that you use the, the word radicand, I think you just earned an A, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> now, yeah, it would have made Math 95 so much easier. Yeah, the, trust me, there's so much here. And there's no way I could teach you all of it, but I'm just trying to teach you my favorite little things whenever I have them. So there you go. There's a couple of my favorites. I'm going to move on now, okay. go back to probability. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is a probability model. So this, it'll have the um, outcomes along the left. And then I don't care if the frequency is in the middle, that's not so important, but it's helpful. And then you have your probabilities along the right. This is a probability model because it shows all of the probabilities of every outcome that you can have. And so now the last question, you gonna, what was that? Go ahead. Are you gonna want us to just leave it like that or do you want the percentages? I'm leaving. Or will you specify? Just leave it just like this. So be careful with my open okay. math because they will tell you. Um, be they will want fractions sometimes. They will want decimal sometimes. They'll want percent sometimes. So just pay attention to whatever they're asking for. So the the probability of somebody throwing throwing a side with a dot, that would be right here, about thirty two point nine percent, approximately. And you can answer probability, you could say 0 0.329, or you can say 1294 out of 3939. 39. I don't care how you answer it. Um, personally, I don't care, but my open math does care and they'll tell you how they want it. So the last question, would it be unusual to throw a leaning jowler? So you may recall from way, way back when we were looking at the empirical rule, remember everything outside of the two standard deviations is um, an outlier. That's anything that's not in that middle 95%. So anything less than 5% probability of happening is an outlier or is an unusual value. So that's just the rule of thumb. If it's less than 5% chance of happening, it is unusual. Leaning jowlers right here, that's less than 1%. It is definitely unusual. So, so would, a, would a snouter also be less than 5% there because 0 0.03. Yes, it is. It is also, it's 3.5%. So it is also unusual. And trust me, it is another thing that's really hard to throw. And I've never thrown one of those either. I've only played it a couple of times, but uh, I have never thrown either or seen either of those thrown. <laughs> yeah. I've like set it up that way on my own because it's fun, but I've never been able to throw it. And none of my students either. We just play just to play and they've never thrown them either. And I really am dying to see it actually happen. So, 
It's a cute game. It's not very expensive. I recommend it. All right, let's move on. Um, did you say that anything less than 5% is an outlier? Yes, it's considered unusual. Thank you. Okay. So I would like you to try building your own probability model right here. So on the right, there is an, it's an independent. Oh, look at how survey is spelled. That's interesting. Suvery. The funny thing is, is this is copied and pasted and I never notice it says Suvery. Okay, so, <laughs> so I get so distracted so easily. So an independent survey um, shows 200 people were asked their means of travel to work. So go ahead and try building a probability model here, doing what I just did. I'm going to build it quietly behind you. So if you get lost or stuck, then you can um, check my work, check against mine, or catch me in a mistake, because that happens too. I have a little bit of a, a random question about that. Okay. So for an outlier, would it be at 5% or less than? It's technically less than. Okay. So, so if it's equal, if it is five, so like public transportation would be technically inside of being an outlier. Yes. Okay. It's, it's sitting on the fence yeah. trying to decide whether it wants to jump outside. Just hanging out there. Yeah. And, you know, it. I yeah, you're. It's kind of like playing it safe, and I think it would really depend on um, what the context of why you needed to know. But generally, I would not call five percent an outlier. I would call anything less. So if it was zero point um, zero four nine nine, but not repeating, mm -hmm. then it would be um, unusual. If it's yeah. four at uh, four nine repeating, then that is five percent and right weird math land. Right, it's, it becomes effectively 5%. Yes. Okay. It goes with that whole 0 0.9 repeating is one. Mm -hmm. It is actually one. And I know there's like, I, I know this is terrible, but there's like 20 TikTok talkers out there showing their ways about why. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I spend much time on TikTok because it's a time <laughs> suck, but I do <laughs> want it. It does. It does eat time. You look up and you're like, oh, man, where'd that hour go? <laughs> yeah, you watch one video and suddenly an hour has passed. I don't mm -hmm. understand. All right. So this is your basic probability model right here, or the probability of means of travel. How do we do? We do good. OK, so um, the probability that a randomly selected individual uh, individual carpools to work. So all it means by interpreting the data. So where where are we carpool right here? You all you're doing is saying, um, um, it is estimated that about there's about eleven percent chance that this individual carpools to work. That's all you're really saying. Would it be unusual for a randomly selected individual to walk to work? It is because it's two point five percent, so we are unusual. So this one is a yes. I'm going to give you rules about probability distributions in a second. And I think it's a really good idea um, to pay attention because I have it on good authority that the next test, you'll have to determine whether something is a probability distribution or not. So there's a few rules that we need to look at. And I think that my open math asks questions too. So I'm gonna talk about, I guess I'm gonna talk about that right here. Probability models. 
they will always add to 100 or add to one. So let's see here. So it adds, adds to one. Now, if you've rounded, you might end up with 0.99 or 1.01. .01. Rounding can do that, but just basically one. So if you're the one who did all the calculations and you add them up and you end up super close because of rounding, then that's a thing. Uh -oh. So then another thing is all values, all values are between between zero and one. They're all between zero and one. And you're not gonna get a negative probability. You're not gonna have a probability that's more than 100%. So all of your values will be, be between zero and one. Now they can be zero or they can be one, but they're gonna be between zero and one inclusive. And there you go. Those are, those are our rules for a probability distribution. So, yeah. Questions before we move on? Ms. Kleiss? Yes. I sent you a direct message through Zoom. Can you check it right quick? If I uh, do that, it's going to open it for everybody to see. It's the only way I can check it. Oh, that's okay. It's about the test. Proctorio is not allowing me to connect to the servers. I've tried on both my desktop and my laptop. Oh, really? Uh oh. Okay. Um, did you have you contacted um, Proctorio's um, uh, live chat? Text? Yeah, no, their live chat, they're, they're pretty good. I haven't tried their live chat. Yeah, they're, they're usually pretty good at fixing problems. Okay. So they, there may be maybe like a, a button you need to check or something. Sometimes settings, somebody has something setting on their Chrome and they don't realize that they have it a certain way. So okay. could be just a permissions thing. Yeah, because it, it worked the other day with that test exam. Everything was flawless. And then I go to try and log in and get everything set up to take the test here a few minutes ago. And it's blocking me uh, via the connection to the server on both my desktop and my laptop. And you've tried did the same thing. And there was something in my uh, permissions that wasn't allowing it to do the desktop thing. So you might want to check to make sure it has all the permissions again, just to be on the safe side. Okay. Okay. I'll try it again. And if not, then I'll, I'll try live chat. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Good luck. Fingers crossed for you. Okay. Let's go to the next page then. Okay. So um, the classical method of, of the classical method requires equally likely outcomes. You're not going to need to memorize that. We're going to move on. So what it is, Every event has to have the same probability of occurring in order to use the classical method. Um, this is also theoretical probability, but every every event has to have the same um, probability of happening. So that's the other word is theoretical. Theoretical probability. I, I'm just happy. This is the other word for it that I learned it by. And I, for me, it just makes more sense because it's theoretical. It's based on mathematically what should happen rather than on the trials you did. So I don't care if you remember that it's theoretical, but in my brain, that helps me. So I will throw it out and you can grab it or just let it go. All right. So here we go. So this is the theoretical probability or the classical method. So the numerator is how many ways can E occur? So if we're taking a look at rolling an even number on a die, um, that it can occur three ways. There are three ways I can get an even number on a die. There are six possible outcomes. And as I said before, we simplify. So you don't have to do the experiment. You just have to know the probability of, of the, um, the events occurring or how many ways it can occur and how many possible outcomes we have. So this is a theoretical or classical method. And we'll be doing quite a bit of this with, um, with decks of cards and rolling dice and things like that. And our calculator, it's so cool because it can do these really cool like probability simulations. It can toss coins, roll dice, pick marbles, draw cards, random numbers, spinning spinners. It is so cool, sorry. I will put my calculator down 
Kleiss, step away from the calculator. All right, let's math it up a little bit. Suppose we had a fun-sized bag of M&M, and there's nine brown candies, six yellow candies, seven red candies, four orange candies, two blue, two greens. So we're gonna randomly select a candy. So every single candy in the bag has the same probability of being chosen. So let's count how many we have. I have nine plus six is 15, plus seven is 22, plus four is 26, 27, 28. There's 30 candies in this bag. The probability that it is yellow would be, so there's six yellow, would be six out of 30, because there's six ways we can get yellow out of a total of 30 candies. And then we simplify it because that's what we do with our fractions and get one fifth. So now we get the probability that it's blue. There are two candies in here that are blue out of 30 candies, and that is 1 15th because we simplify our fractions. So letter C just says comment on the likelihood that a candy is yellow versus blue. So there's a th three times, three times better chance of grabbing a yellow than there is of grabbing a blue. That's all it is. It doesn't want any super fancy stuff. It just it's three times like more likely to grab a yellow than a blue. Questions? All right, moving on up. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna calculate where a pair of fair dice is rolled. We're gonna calculate the probability of rolling a seven. One thing I love about this setup here is that the same numbers are on a diagonal. So here's all my sevens. So there's 36 outcomes and here's all my sevens. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Six ways to get a seven. So we do six out of 36 or one sixth. Thank goodness these are easy fractions. I don't wanna have to pull my calculator out to simplify them. I mean, I will because we have the power now, but I don't wanna have to. So I've been, I've been in classes before where people don't know what snake eyes is because apparently it's not super popular to say that anymore. Um, just, you know, it's me being old. I say it to my grandkids though, they know what snake eyes is, but it's also because I'm old. But anyway, snake eyes is just is, rolling a two. Is that one? Yep. Huh. Did you know what snake eyes was, Caleb? I did, yeah. Okay. Good. But I'm uh, I I hang out with people over my age, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's it's strange how some of these Gen Zers don't know what snake eyes. Uh, yeah. Are. The other day I mentioned the Princess Bride and got a blank stare and was completely what? like lost. <laughs> That's like one of the most perfect movies of all time. Everybody exactly. Can see that. <laughs> okay. There's one out of thirty six. <laughs> See, I get sidetracked so easily. One out of 36 probability of rolling a snake eyes. So letter C, all you're saying is that there's six, you're six times more likely to roll snake eyes than roll a seven. Does this make sense? Are we good? Okay. So this is the basic stuff. We are gonna add some stuff to this because I wouldn't be me if I didn't add more stuff to it. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, that's what we're doing now that we're at 5.2. So if you keep track of that sort of thing, we're moving on to 5.2 right now. All right. So two things are disjoint if they don't have anything in common. I'm sure you've all heard of mutually exclusive. So mutually exclusive means that they don't have anything in common at all like being a teacher and having a million dollars, those things are mutually exclusive. <laughs> couldn't help it, just couldn't. Okay, so if I roll a dice um, one time, I can't get both a three and an even number. So those things are mutually exclusive. Sometimes I just can't help myself, you know? All right, so the addition rule, if the two things are mutually exclusive or disjoint, you just add the two probabilities together. 
notice that it says or in between them. So the probability of getting E or F, frequently I'll just refer to this as or probabilities. I won't call it the addition rule. I'll just call it or probabilities because that word or is there. So like the probability of rolling a three or rolling a five would be two out of six or one third. So you just add them together. And I highly recommend keeping your common denominator until after you add them and then simplify. If you simplify first, it's not as much fun. However, your calculator can do the math for you. And I mean, that's always fun. Playing with the calculator is always fun. Okay, moving on. What does F mean? F, so the probability, of, it's just another event because I can't put E and E. I could put E1 and E2, but it's just another variable. Okay, all these. Nope, yeah. Yeah, so like this right here, I just went down the alphabet. The probability of E, F, or G, or more. So if I have like a ton of different things, but they're all disjoint, then you can just keep adding those probabilities together as long as they're all disjoint. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's do some math here. Oh, this, okay. okay. The probability model here shows the distribution of the number of rooms and housing units sold in the US. I'm not gonna have a four bedroom unit. That's also a seven bedroom unit. These things are mutually exclusive. So the first thing we do to verify that it's a probability model is we would add all of these up and make sure they add up to one. And then we're gonna look at this and make sure that they're between zero and one. Those are the two things that we need to check. So there's my two things right there. I checked both those things. All probabilities are between zero and one and they add up to one. Okay, moving on. So now we wanna know the, the probability a randomly selected housing unit has two or three rooms. So I want this probability and this probability because they're mutually exclusive and this is a probability model. I can just add those two things together. Is that going to show up? Nope. So I will do 0 0.032 plus 0 0.093. I'm going to use it in my calculator because I'm not really trusting my math right now. So it would be 0 0.125. So about a 12.5 chance of a randomly selected housing unit having two or three bedrooms. Make sense? Questions? So with the, sorry, with letter A, mm -hmm. um, you add them all together and then you would equals, it, you would, it would equal one. And if it equaled one, then that's means that it's uh, inconclu inconclusive. No, this, this is inclusive means including one and zero. It, okay. what inclusive means, it means one and one and zero are included. So if it adds up to one, these are the two things. It has to be between zero and one, and it has to add up to one. These are the two things that we check off to make sure it's a probability model. Oh, okay. So is, that, yeah. so is that essentially checking that you, you have essentially 100% of your options covered? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. How Are we good on this page? I was just gonna say, like, it, obviously, if one of those probabilities listed had a one in it, then once you added it all together, it wouldn't equal one. Exactly. So it wouldn't exactly. be right. So I mean, it's you're rarely gonna see one that has a one in it. You will occasionally see something that has a zero in it, um, but most of the time you won't see a one because that would be really boring. And what kind of math are you gonna do? So it'd be really boring. So like, you know, the probability that um, I'm gonna wake up in the morning and still be broke, one. I don't know what, I don't know what it is about money. I haven't like not been thinking about money all day or anything. I've been testing kids. Maybe that's why I'm loopy because I've been giving a test. Except I was really proud of myself. I wrote a really great bonus problem and the kids just didn't appreciate it at all. So rude. All right. 
Well, you could always write us bonus problems for extra credit. We, we will be excited about it. <laughs> yeah, I would be very excited, excited about that. We would all be like, man, that was a really great bonus problem. Thank you so much, Melissa. Only yeah. for extra credit, though. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. So now go. I would like you to try this. Compute the probability of the event just drawing a king. And then compute the probability of the event draw a king or a queen or a jack. Try it. If you get stuck, that's okay. Then you just sit there and look pretty and wait for me. Solved it quietly. So if you need to check, you can check. So I got 0 0.769 for A. Did Is that just because you kept yours a... Uh, yeah. Are we keeping them a fraction or... I generally keep them fractions unless some... Yeah, I mean, I... I got the same for, for A. I mean, I usually keep them fractions, but it you don't have to. But I usually do just because fractions are more accurate than than rounded decimals. So I usually just keep them fractions unless I need them for decimals for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, would it be a pain in the butt for you to show me how to do that, enter that in into the calculator again on how to make something a fraction? Okay, so do you need me to show you or can I just tell you and see if it works? Yeah, can you just, can you just uh, tell me? Okay, so... Um, is the, the last number you got the 0 0.769? Is that still hanging out in your calculator? Yeah. If it's, is that the last answer you got? Sorry, what was that? I'm my just, kid. Okay. Arrow up and highlight it and then hit enter. Okay. Okay. Now hit the math button. It's right under alpha. It says okay. math and it's your first option and hit enter and then enter again. Math. Okay, I just got the same thing. Like okay, zero. I will just do it. So one divided by thirteen. Uh oh, what's going on here? Okay, why is it not typing? One. I don't know what's going on here. Let me clear. Okay. Okay, now it's working. So one divided by thirteen, and I'm gonna get this big thing here. So okay. you have to leave the whole thing in there or highlight this whole thing. If you um, simplify, if you cut it off at all, it's not going to work. But then I'm going to hit math, choose the first option, and hit enter, and it'll give me my fraction. Oh, okay. All so right. if you typed in zero seven six, whoops, zero point zero seven six nine, you're not going to get a fraction out of that because it's probably not a good fraction. You have to actually leave the whole thing in there. Yeah. See. So you okay, actually have so to leave if it. If it's not a good fraction, it's not going to do anything. Right. Okay, that's probably why it wasn't working earlier for me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I most of the time I just leave them as fractions just because it's more accurate, and I kind of like fractions. But unless I tell you the way you have to leave it, you can leave it however you want. Okay. How do we do? Do we do good? Okay. You guys ready for the next level of difficulty? Okay. Sometimes things are not disjoint. Sometimes they have something in common, like um, rolling a three and rolling a multiple of three. Those two things have something in common. So sometimes they have something in common. And I'm gonna show you the why on this in a minute. So you can go ahead and write it down first. And then I'll tell you the why on it. So the probability of rolling either E or F or of, of E or F happening is the probability of E 
plus the probability of F minus their overlap. So probability of both things happening. Go ahead and write this down and I'll show you the why on it in a second. So I don't know about you, but if I don't know why something works, I hardly ever remember it. So is this kind of like the, the same thing if you if you changed it where you the probability of rolling a three and an odd number? Would that be the, the same yeah. where it's where it's yeah. not disjoint? Yeah, because rolling it so rolling a three would be one sixth, right? Mm -hmm. Rolling an odd number would be three sixths, but wasn't three just counted twice? Right. So, so you I have just to subtract, subtract one of those off. Right, exactly. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. See, you just stole my thunder right there. It's okay. You can have all my thunder. All right. Everyone got that written down? Can move on? Let's I feel like Caleb needs to have an extra support class for us. <laughs> <laughs> or he's got a really great voice, though. He can just do the, the stats recitation podcast. <laughs> the stats podcast. That would be great. <laughs> Hey, I'd listen. You've got a really great voice. You have like this radio voice or podcast voice. Oh, thanks so much. You're welcome. All right, we're going to move on. Here we go. Here, you're going to see the why here, and I'm going to use highlighters because highlighters are fun. So we're going to compute the probability of the events drawing a king or drawing a diamond. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight all the kings. There we go. I'm going to highlight all the kings because I can. And then I'm going to write the probability of getting a king, as we know, is 452, because there's four of them out of 52. And I'm going to get another highlighter. I want the pink one because I'm cool like that. Drawing a diamond. So drawing a diamond is right here. Do, 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 do. Color that in because it's fun. We like to color. And then so that is plus 13 out of 52. Notice though, the king is colored twice. Because the king is colored twice, I can't count him twice. So I need to subtract one of those off because I counted it twice. So then you just math it out. This will not, I don't think this will be simplifiable. No, it will be because I'm gonna have four plus 13 is 17 minus one, I have 16 out of 52 which is 826, 413. Doesn't seem right, is that right? 16, 826, yeah, it's 4 thirteenths. Sometimes I just don't trust myself. Does that make sense, questions? I'm just so excited about the calculator turning it into a fraction. <laughs> If you learn nothing else in this class, that's what you're going to take with you, right? <laughs> I hate fractions. <laughs> so, and the thing is, is it's like adding fractions and subtracting fractions. You just do four divided by 52 plus 13 divided by 52 minus one divided by 52. Hit enter and it'll give you a really ugly decimal. And then you hit that math, math fraction and ta-da, you'll have four thirteenths. So put it all in there. It'll, it does this. It'll do everything. I haven't figured out how to get it to wash my car yet, but I'm sure that it's in there somewhere. So as soon as I learn, I'll teach y'all. Okay. Next one. Let's do Let's do another one. I would like you to try this one. Um, hopefully you printed out the PowerPoint. If you don't, didn't, you don't get to highlight fun things. So the probability of rolling a multiple of six or rolling doubles. So your multiples of six would be six and 12. Wait, six, yeah, six and 12. I'll highlight, I'll do this for you. That's not six, that's five. I can't count. Here's sixes. And here's a 12. The PowerPoint says, or rolling a multiple of three. Yes, I changed it because I didn't like that one. It wasn't as exciting as this one. Okay, I will change my PowerPoint paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, I left it on the PowerPoint because that's the one with the pre-recorded video. And so it's still there. Once I re-record that video, then I'll change the PowerPoint also. 
but since that goes along with the pre-recorded video, I haven't changed it yet. It's okay. I was just giving you crap. Please do. Please do. I need a different color. Okay. <laughs> I love bed doubles. They're also on a diagonal. Overlap here because I like pink. You will highlight the overlaps pink. Okay. And make sure that if I do something wrong, y'all tell me. So I have 10 out of 36, which is 5 eighteenths. How'd we do? Cool beans. Questions? I missed it. What was that? I missed the whole thing. You missed I it? Missed, yeah, I got it all wrong. Okay. So when it says double, I have because I only calculated what you had highlighted in red. Oh, okay. And this so, is a four though. So you have to you have to look at all the doubles. Okay. So when I'm doing this part right here, I treat them as two completely separate things. So one of them is just the probability of rolling a multiple of six. So you only look at the sixes. And then the other one is a completely different event, rolling doubles. And then the, but, this one is where you bring them together. How come you did six over 36 plus six over 36 when... The sixes, the dice sixes were five. Because minus. I can't count. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. If you were in my high school class, I would have thrown candy at you right now. Yay. <laughs> Whenever somebody catches me in a math error, I throw candy at them. So nine out of 36. So that's one fourth. Is that better? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Make sure you're always catching my mistakes. Okay, That's another example of your math teacher is human. Other questions now that we have the correct math? Wait, but isn't um, the rolling a multiple of six? Uh -huh. Six instead of oh, five? Oh, it was six. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. So you were right, I think, at first. Uh, see you guys? <laughs> Yeah, it was it was getting me. It was taking me a second to figure. I was like, I I counted six as well. So you know, <laughs> wait, wait, now I'm lost. Yeah. Okay, it hold happened. on. I'm gonna go back and fix it. Just a second. <laughs> I, I will. We're gonna do this again. You know, we're just gonna chalk this up to we are all really tired. Yep, there's too okay. much sun. So let me let me get my highlighters out again. I'm gonna clear a bunch of these pen marks, and we're gonna we're gonna do this again. Okay, I'm gonna get out my highlighters. We like blue. So here's all of the things that are a multiple of six. So these ones are all sixes, but then 12 is also a multiple of six. So that is six. And then with my pink highlighter, all the things that are double. So we got the six out of six, one, two, three, four, five, six, a six out of 36. So now rolling doubles, it's all of these ones that I'm making pink right now. Well, wouldn't that be considered rolling a 12? But it's a multiple of six. Because okay. six times two is... Oh, 12. rolling a multiple. Okay. Yes. Are we there now? Okay. I think we're all yes. there. Okay. Cool beans. I think I don't think any of us had a problem with the overlap part, did we? Woo! Not, nobody had a problem with the overlap part. It was just the, the whole weird weirdness happening here. All right. We're going to move on. Okay, complement. This is the math telling you that even if you made mistakes, you really did a good job today. Either that or it is <laughs> the probability of something not happening. So 
if I was like saying the probability somebody rolled a six, okay, what's the probability of not rolling a six? So you just do one minus, which is 100% minus whatever that probability is. And it sounds all super well and good and easy and like, oh yeah, that's super easy. And we will make it a little more difficult because that's the nature of the beast. So the complement rule is just one minus something, the probability of not getting that outcome. So here's an example. So um, apparently 31.6% of, of American households own a dog. The probability that a randomly selected house does not own a dog is one minus the probability that somebody owns a dog. So it'd be one minus 0. 0.316. So that would be, is that already on there? Oh, I thought maybe they mathed it for me, 0. 0.684. So the probability of somebody not owning a dog, about 68.4%. So it's just one minus. And the complement rule, if you can remember it, it will become your friend. So just, you know, play nice with the complement rule. Compliment it right back. Okay, <laughs> moving on. So let's take a look here. So there are a total of um, 318,800 residents in Hartford County. The probability a randomly selected resident will have a commute time of 90 or more minutes is this right here. So if I wanted to know the probability that somebody has a commute time of less than 90 minutes, I can either calculate all of these probabilities or I could just do one minus 0 0.015, which is so much easier. I do not want to calculate all of these probabilities and add them up. So you just do one minus the 0 0.015. It could be even the same thing. Like what if we were talking about the probability somebody had a commute of less than 60 minutes? I could take these two probabilities and add them together and then do one minus. And basically you do that until it becomes more work to do that than to do it the other way. Questions? So that's not just with at least one, that's with anything less than one of the greater values. So if I, I'm, I'm confused. So you, I'm confused too. I'm trying to, I don't know what you're yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm confused as well. Okay. So in homework yesterday, she was teaching us um, at the at least one rule, which is one minus the probability of that happening X amount of time. Okay, so I think that that's at the end of this. I think that's oh. a recorded video. Okay. We're not there yet. We're getting there. Okay. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> We're getting there. I think she just watched the pre-recorded video and so she knows what's coming. So we're going to add everything together in order to get the probability or we can minus. So I... Yes. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, you're good. I'm just uh, trying to understand. So, so I have that this is 0 0.015. I could get all of these probabilities if I wanted to, right? I'm, I don't want to sit here and math them all out, but I could get all of these probabilities. So I know this right here is the probability somebody has a commute of 90 minutes or more. So if I wanted to know the probability that someone had a commute of less than 90 minutes, I would either have to find all of these probabilities and add them together or I just do one minus 0 0.015. Because remember this adds up to one. So doing one minus this one will yeah. give me all of these. Okay, so where did the 4,895 come from? Is that from the person who 90 minutes or more? Yeah, that's somebody just collected the data. From oh, Parker okay. County. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. We just don't have the relative frequency yet. And I don't didn't really want to calculate all these probabilities because that'd be a lot of work. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Are we good? 
Yes, thank you. All right. So here's an example. It's probably the easiest example. If 25% of a deck of cards have the suit of hearts, what's the probability you will not draw a heart? So I'm looking for the probability of not a heart. Would that be 75%? Right. So it's one minus the probability of a heart. And obviously you could just do this in your head, but I think that like the point is that you can just do it in your head. Kind of an easy example there. But trust me, I will make it more difficult. So you have to use the fancy schmancy calculator. All right, moving on. Section 5.3, if you keep track of that sort of thing, we are now in 5.3. We're gonna do some super fun stuff. We're gonna do and probabilities. So we just did or probabilities. The or probabilities, if you're doing two things or one thing or another, we use the addition rule. So now we are in and probabilities. But the first thing we need to determine first here is whether things are independent or dependent. So things are independent if one, one thing does not affect the other. So the probability of one thing happen doesn't affect the probability of the other thing happening. And they're dependent if the probability of one thing happening does affect the other. So those are independent and dependent. We'll go through some examples and it should help. So we're only gonna use what we're learning here if they are independent and talking about when they're dependent on each other is something we do in Math 244. We won't even be doing that here. I'll give you a second. I think we're not too far from the end. Yeah, we have nine slides left. We're doing awesome. Okay, move on. Another moment. We're good, okay. So independent or not. So here's some examples. Suppose you draw a card from a standard 52 deck of cards, 52 card deck, then you roll a die. The events draw a heart and roll an even number are independent. So me drawing a card out of the deck is not gonna affect what happens with the dice. Those are independent. And that one's kind of obvious. I'm gonna get it less obvious. Two, suppose two 40 year old women who live in the United States are randomly selected. The events woman one survives the year and woman two survives the year are independent. So, I mean, it is possible these two randomly selected women are in the same car. They're like Thelma and Louise or something. But we, in general, if you if I took two randomly selected women out of the entire United States, their lives are not likely to intertwine at all. This one, however, this was one that baffles people. Suppose two 40-year-old women live in the same apartment complex. The events woman one survives the year and woman two survives the year are dependent their lives affect each other in some way, shape, or form. So even if they're not friends, they don't know each other, still, they live in the same apartment complex. And for all I know, woman one can set a fire because she falls asleep with a cigarette. Woman two can drop something on the stairs and woman one can like slip on it. So they could affect each other. So we can't say they're independent because it, they have the possibility of affecting each other. Does that make sense? So as long as there is like something in common in a sense yeah then you can say it's dependent yeah if they have something some way that could possibly affect each other yeah okay, okay. let's take a look suppose you flip a coin twice on the first flip it lands on heads and on the second flip it lands on tails dependent or independent there these are independent. It, I mean, there's always the chance. I, I like to play devil's advocate sometimes. You could have left some residue on it or something the first flip. We're pretending none of that happened. So are the events earned a bachelor's degree and earned more than $100,000 per year, dependent or independent? They're dependent. Because, yeah, they're, they're dependent. Depends on your degree, but they're dependent. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. Y'all are thinking it now, though. I planted the seed. 
I didn't I didn't hear anything about teaching on that one. <laughs> let her see. Let her oh look, let her be twice. Look at look at me go. Two 24-year-old males in the United States are chosen at random. Male one gets into a car accident during the year, and male two gets into a car accident during the year. Are they dependent or independent? Hmm. Independent. Independent. Because I didn't say that they live in that they um carpool to work together. So they're definitely independent. There's no way, there's pretty, pretty unlikely, pretty much 0% or it's really close to 0% chance of these two randomly selected males being in each other's lives. Right. We feeling okay about dependent and independent? All right. Let's do some math. I, multiplication rule. The multiplication rule if they are independent, is you just multiply the two probabilities together. And this is and. I frequently will just call this and probabilities because it's the probability of this and that happening. So both things must be true. That's an and probability. So if you answer a question, ask a question in the discussion board, I could say this is an and probability. So... This is how I refer to things. I'll let you write it down and we will do some math. Is that only for independent? So dependent would have a different outcome if, if it was and? Yeah, so um, dependent events, I have, there's a whole different math for that. And we don't learn it in 243. So only for independent events. And you're not going to be given dependent events. So. So in our test, we're not going to have like this question and then we have to decipher whether or not it's independent or dependent in what math to do no you're not oh, then because the you. the if they're not independent yeah it's a whole whole nother whole nother crazy craziness if you go on to 244 you can have that craziness we're only going to do independent events but because some of you might go on to 244 it's important that i make sure to stress that this these are for independent events, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. The probability of randomly select, selected female aged 60 years or older or 60 years old will survive the year is pretty good, 99.186%. What is the probability that two randomly selected females will survive the year? So this is probability the first survives and probability the second survives. So we do first survives and second survives. So we multiply the same thing by itself two times or multiply it by itself. So 0.99186 times 0.99186. The probability of the first survives and the probability of the second survives. About a 98.4% chance. I think that's pretty good. Likely both of them will still be alive. You know, I think 60 is the new 40 or something like that. So it's what I hear. I'm not there yet. I'm not at 60, but I'll let you know once I get there. All right, let's move on. Suppose you flip a fair coin twice. What is the probability you obtain a head on both flips? So heads on the first flip, heads on the second flip. I don't really like this problem because probabilities are the same 0.5 either way, but it is what it is. So we so it's probability of H and H. So this would be 0.5 times 0.5 because we have about a 50% chance. We have a 50% chance of it landing either way. 0.5 times 0.5. And I know what this is, but I don't trust myself. Yes, it is 0.25. My math today though has been really horrible. So it's like I'm putting everything in the calculator because for some reason, just can't math today. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I thought it was 0.10. <laughs> See, there you go. Thank you, Kylie, making me feel better. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. At, see, calculus class today, we're, we're preparing for the AP exam. I can do all of the super complicated calculus stuff, but the basic, basic math, the basic like addition and subtraction all my numbers were really wonky, but I can do the calculus. I just couldn't do the other stuff. All right. So a manufacturer of exercise equipment knows 
10% of their products are defective. They also know that only 30% of their customers will actually use the equipment in the first year after it's purchased. There is a one year warranty on the equipment. What proportion of customers will actually make a valid warranty claim? So what we're looking for is the probability that it is defective and used. So it has been used and it is defective. So it has to be both things. So the probability of the product being defective is 0.1. Probability of somebody using it is 0.3. So this kind of math is actually used by companies to see if it's worth fixing issues they have with their equipment because they want to know, is it really going to, is it going to cost me more money to fix it? Or is it going to cost me more money to pay for those claims? So this is not unusual to have this kind of math. So right here, 0 0.03. So my next question, I could have done that in my head. That would have been easy. So my next question to you is, would it be unusual for a person to both use the equipment in the first year and it be defective? Yes, because it's under five. Yes, good job. It's less than 5%. So yes, it would be unusual. So they probably are not going to pay the money to fix their equipment or whatever's defective about it. So that, unfortunately, it is what it is. Questions? Are we feeling okay so far? Okay, good, good, good. Oh, look at that. We're assuming, I'm going to do this. We're assume, we assumed that defectiveness was independent of the use so we just made that assumption and I should have done that beforehand, sorry. All right. Okay, I want, I want you to try this one on your own. The probability a randomly selected female that were, like if I randomly selected four females, what's the probability that all four of them will survive the year? So go ahead and try this one on your own. really don't want to put it in like that you could do this to the fourth power I don't know if any of you got there on your own it's okay if you didn't you did good good job good job you got approximately 0 0.9678 pat yourself on the back good job so there's about a 96.8% chance that all four of them will survive the year. How'd we do? Feeling okay? Any questions before? I, th I think at least probabilities are next. Yes. So before we get to at least probabilities, are we feeling okay? Yep. Okay. It was until you said at least. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. What's the probability at least one of you is okay to move forward? I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. So every time you see the words at least, think complement rule. Every single time if you see the words at least, think complement rule. I'm going to write this down. Complement rule. Even if you don't spell it that way, if you spell it wrong, it's okay. Think complement rule. So we're looking for the probability at least one male out of a thousand age 24 and up will die during the course of the year. The probability he survives each or one person survives about 99.86%. So we're looking for the probability at least one dies. Okay, so this is the same thing as the probability not 1,000 live. I know, that's really sad, right? So this is going to be 
one minus the probability not or what one minus the probability a thousand live. I, I, I don't know why I can't write this. Okay, a thousand live. So you find the probability that all 1,000 of them live, and then we find the not part. So it'd be one minus 0 0.9986. And I really don't think you wanna put that into your calculator a thousand times. So do an exponent. Remember an exponent is this little caret button right above the division sign, that little upside down chevron. It's called a caret. I got 0 0.7536 approximately. So the probability at least one dies is about 75.36% chance out of a thousand people. So you just need to change it to, you know, the, like basically the opposite. So the if at least one dies, then not all 1000 of them will live. And that kind of makes sense, right? I think I have one more of these. So we can try it again. Any questions before we do one more? All right. Okay. This one is a little more confusing, but among 21 to 25 year olds, 29% say they have driven while under the influence of alcohol. Suppose that three are chosen at random. What is the probability at least one has not driven under the influence. See if you can figure it out. I'm gonna give you a minute and then I'll help you. But I will write. There's your setup. If you if you didn't get the setup, there's the setup. Yeah, that question threw me off because it said the twenty nine percent, and but then they selected three of them, mm -hmm. so I got confused. Yeah. So I find that writing these out really helps me writing this out is kind of like the interpreting the problem. And I don't know if it, if that's the same with all of you, but it, it really helps me to write, write the probability, you know, and figure out what the not part is because all of these at least have a not part. So I got approximately 97.56%, which makes sense because 29%. Um, so if 29% of them have driven while under the influence, that's about a third. And so the probability, I mean, it would make sense that probability that um, at least one hasn't. Questions? That was the last slide. Y'all are rock stars tonight, catching me on my mistakes and I'm pretending my jokes are funny. <laughs> Questions, questions for the, while we're still on recording. All right, I'm going to unrecord and stop that.